opportunity. Um, when we pray that God uses it, sometimes He opens doors that we're not the most comfortable with, but I believe we should you know, go through any door that God opens for us. So I'm also thankful for my husband. Um, he helped me kind of get my thoughts all organized, so the, the nifty little points they were his idea. So I'm appreciating it. Okay. Um, you can go ahead and turn in your Bible to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 1. I'm going to be talking about a woman, her God, and her husband. And when I first heard the topic, I thought, well, you know, talk about submissiveness, because that's you know, the easiest. But Brother Bill kind of already talked about that, you know, several, a couple weeks ago, and that wasn't really what I was feeling led to do. I was so I thought of talking about um, taking the importance of taking your husband to your God in prayer. And this can really be applied to anybody in here because we, we all need to pray more in our lives. Yes. Anyways, 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 8. Then said Elkanah her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? Why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post in the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall be no razor come upon his head. I want to first talk about a handmaiden's prayer. Um, obviously, in here, she's not praying for her, her husband. She's praying for a child. But I think her prayer is a, a good thing to follow. If we look in verse 8. Her husband asks her, Hannah, why weepest thou? Have you ever wept for your husband before? You know, if your husband isn't saved, you need to be weeping for your husband because he's lost and he's going to hell. That's the greatest thing that you can do for your husband. If you want to really love your husband, then you need to take him to God in prayer. Brother Predick, the president of the Bible school we went to, said that when you get serious about praying, God will get serious about answering. Amen. If you show God that you mean business, you know, you'll get results. God wants to hear you bringing up your husband in prayer. That is the greatest thing that you can do for him. Whether your husband is saved or maybe he's carnal or he's not the spiritual leader of your home or even if your husband's saved, he need, our husbands need our prayer. And if you're single tonight and you're unmarried, you can probably one day you're going to get married. God doesn't call God doesn't call most people to be single. If you called everybody to be single, to be single, then the world couldn't go on. So if you want to get married someday, you probably are. And you can pray for your husband now, even before you meet him. That's what I did for my husband. And it, it doesn't hurt any at all. It certainly doesn't. <laughs> and the second thing we notice in verse 8, her husband asked her, And why eatest thou not? Hannah was fasting. Um, I think it's a shame that fasting is a it's a lost it's a lost practice in the church nowadays, and it and it really shouldn't be that way. If you really want to you know get results, we should we should start fasting. Jesus said in Matthew chapter seventeen verse twenty one, "Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting." I realize there he was talking about demons and stuff, but it doesn't it does not hurt to add fasting to your prayers. If you really want to get serious with God. You really want to show them that you mean business? Add some fasting to your prayers. And then we read, he asked, Why is thy heart grieved? Hannah's heart was grieved. Hannah was broken before God. Um, when you're you know, in situations with your husband, or if he's not saved, don't nag him. Don't complain to him. That doesn't help anything. Husbands don't like nagging wives. Um, Colossians 3.18 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as it is fit in the Lord. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband. Does anybody see the word Christian in this verse? No. This verse implies you submit yourself to your husband even if he isn't saved. If he's not asking you to sin, he, you need to submit to your husband. Maybe, maybe he's you know, carnal and stuff, but... You still need to submit to your husband. Even if he isn't doing his duty and his part and not loving you like Christ, you still need to do your job. Amen. 1 Peter 3, 1 says, If any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Yes. God didn't give 
give us the job of conviction, of, to convict others. God put the Holy Spirit here in the world to convict. It's not our job to tell our husbands that he's sinning and that he's going to hell and that he's um, what he's doing is just wrong and he needs to, you know, not watch that and not do this. Leave it up to God. The Holy Spirit does a lot better job of convicting than we do because that's not our place. If you can, you know, invite your husband to go to church and everything, but if it's a touchy subject, if he doesn't want to talk about it, honor your husband and don't talk about it. You can stop bringing it up to him, but don't ever stop bringing your husband out to God. Yes, that is the best thing that you can do. Amen. Even if he's not saved, you need to honor him and bring him up before the Lord. You never know when God is working in unseen ways in his life. You never know when someone else might witness to him during the day and he might not ever tell you about it. You never know when he's out on his job and God is just working in his life and convicting him. And he might not just tell you about it. God is working. You might not be able to see it, but I promise that he is working. Amen. The second thing I want to look at is hell's response to prayer. Hell's response to prayer. Satan hates to hear prayer going up. Right. The thing that Satan fears the most is somebody who knows how to get a hold of God. Right. Somebody who knows to get into God's throne room and knock on the door of God's throne is somebody who means business and somebody who knows what the word of God is and somebody knows that there's power in prayer. Yes. Satan knows what the word of God says. Satan knows that, the, that God promises to answer the prayers of his people. And he fears Christians that know how to get down on their knees and go to God and mean business before him. Right. My husband's been teaching on spiritual warfare. Prayer is the greatest weapon that we have. The greatest weapon that we have as a Christian is, is prayer, and it's the most neglected one in the church. Yes. Yes. What happened to our prayer meetings? You know, what happened to you know all night prayers and our our saints of God that are known as prayer warriors? Don't let the most greatest weapon that you have be the most neglected. Mm -hmm. The word of God and prayer. Don't yes. neglect those. Second Corinthians ten four says um, that our weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty. Matthew 11, 12 says, The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. And if we are in a war. You need to you know, be violent before God, you know, yeah. against Satan mm -hmm. for your husband, you know, yeah. for his life and for his soul. Or anybody you know that's not saved, you have to take it before God. Yeah. You have to rebuke the devil. Right. Yeah. Amen. That's how you win. You have to realize that this is spiritual warfare that we are in. And the third thing we're going to look at is heaven's response to prayer. God answers prayer. Amen. Um, in Hannah's situation, if you go down to verse 19, it says, The Lord remember her. We all know that she had Samuel. God answered her prayer. Mm -hmm. God loves to answer the prayers of his children. Yep. You know, God wants to see your husband saved more than you do. Because mm -hmm. God loves your husband more than you do. God loves your children more than you do. God wants your husband to be the spiritual leader of your home more than you do. God sent his son to die for your husband. He loves your husband more than you do. He wants your husband to be a prayer warrior more than you do. He wants your husband to be in church more than you do. God can take care of your husband. And his it doesn't matter who you are. God wants to answer your prayer. Sometimes we think, well, you know, that was, that was Hannah or that was the great man, Peter, you know. They were just great spiritual people. I don't and then we don't think our prayers mean as much, but they really do. If you look in James 5.17, it says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. He was just like we are. So we cannot say that, no, that was just Elijah, that was just a great man, or that was Hannah, a great woman. God. Because Elijah was just like us. The Bible says so. It says that he prayed for a drought, that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years, and his prayer got answered. We read in the Bible that Elijah raised a little boy from the dead. Right. Pastor Seville talked about the miracle that he did with the widow and her food. And then we read in 1 Kings 18 that Elijah saw fire come down from heaven. Right. With the situation in the prophets of Baal, he saw the fire of God consume not only the sacrifice, but the fire of God burned up water and burned mm -hmm. up rocks and it burned up dust. Elijah saw all these great miracles 
and his life, God performed through him. But if we go in 1 Kings 19, where do we find Elijah at? He's running for his life from a woman named Jezebel. He's running from a woman. He goes into the wilderness. He sits under a tree and says, you know, Lord, just kill me now. After he's seen all these miracles, he runs from a woman and says, God, kill me. Kind of reminds me of Jonah. Didn't Jonah, you know, sit under a tree and say, God, just kill me. Listen, Elijah doubted just like we are. Elijah had crises in his life of faith just like we are. I mean, how many of us have, you know, run and said, God, just kill me now. I mean, so depressed that you just want to die. Elijah was definitely like we are. I just want to conclude by saying, when you get serious about praying, God, God will answer. You know, we need to just go boldly before the throne of grace and remember that if we ask, God answers. If we see, mm -hmm. you know, He answers. If we knock on the door, God will open it up. In Mark 11, 24, Jesus said, What things soever ye desire when we pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. When ye, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. It's a, it's, it should be so easy, you know, just ask and you receive. That's what the word says, but you know, we really make it harder than it, than it really is. I really encourage you to, you know, get into the word of God and read what the Bible says about prayer and 